Thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm super excited to um, present our study. Of course, these are all in work. So I'm gonna show you what we have so far and um, what we still have to do. Uh, next slide, please. I wanna introduce our team. Uh, first of all, this is um, our science definition team from the proposal and our engineering team comes from Goddard where we did, where we're doing the studies. Um, we also uh, incorporated the science team from a different proposal um, that also was targeting uh, lunar sample return um, via a similar architecture. Um, so we're very pleased to have this blended team. Um, and in asterisk, there are early career scientists. So you can see that we range a variety of disciplines um, and institutions and career stage. And thank you particularly to the engineering team and, and lots of people who aren't um, listed here for all the work that they've been doing as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so this uh, is a, um, it's going to be a little different from the slides you're going to, or from the studies you're going to see um, for the rest of the workshop. Um, we're interested in uh, how to help NASA capitalize on its investments that it's been making in the last decade or two in in situ geochronology instrumentation. So um, through the PIP and Picasso and Matisse and DALI programs and instrument development programs, NASA has been investing in radiometric uh, dating techniques across a variety of PIs and techniques. And these instruments will come into their own in time for the next decadal survey, meaning they'll be TRL-6 by this program by the time the next decadal survey uh, takes effect in 2023 which means they're ready to infuse into missions. So the goal of our study is to assess how these kinds of instruments could be put onto missions and how we could accomplish important science goals across the inner solar system, specifically moon, Mars, and asteroids. So we've conducted a, a variety of uh, concept studies, uh, very maturity, but there, because we have so many, there are sort of three to four, um, getting to a, a trades and um, point design assessment. And our goal is to give this report to the next decadal survey panel um, and provide them with alternative alter architectures for accomplishing geochronology goals. Geochronology goals have showed up in the last two decadal surveys. Um, you might be most familiar with South Fort Aiken Basin sample return on the moon um, to assess basin geochronology but there are a variety of other really important science goals that are out there that have been called out, um, but that maybe have required sample return, um, which may be out of um, budget for planetary science. And so the goal of the study was to bring in some more options for the decadal survey to look at, to um, get at some of these really important science goals within a new frontiers envelope. Next slide, please. So geochronology, the science of geochronology is uh, determining absolute ages for rocks. Um, but this is uh, a little bit deceptively simple. Determining the age for a rock is really a proxy for understanding the history of a planet. When we talk about when was Mars warm and wet, or when, when did big basins form on the moon and the earth and the asteroids, um, anytime we have those when questions or how long was the surface habitable, those kinds of questions are all related to geochronology and you need absolute ages of rocks to record that record that history to be able to make progress on these questions. So it, we contend and we have the backup to show it that major advances in planetary science can be driven by getting absolute ages of rocks within the next decade. So this is both to calibrate body-specific chronologies, that is, to understand when events happen on different planets, especially relative to the Earth, and to create this framework for solar system evolution. Right now, the framework for each body is very body-specific. But if we have big basins forming on the Moon, were they forming at the same time on Mars and the Earth? And does that tell us something about solar system dynamics more than just the, the history of that surface? So this big picture science goal determining the history of major events 
uh, it's too big to wrap a mission around, even though that's what's driving us in these directions. And so we broke this down into some very specific science objectives, and there are more. There are lots of different science objectives that would get at those big picture science goals. These are just the ones that we chose for this study. Determine the chronology of base informing impacts and constrain this time period of heavy bombardment across the inner solar system. Constrain the uncertainty in solar system chronology in this middle age between one and three billion years. This is when we don't have uh, radiometric absolute age tide points on the moon. And when we slide ages around between one and three billion years, you get really different models of planetary evolution for places like Mars. And constrain the history and hydration of hydration and habitability across the solar system. Again, when was Mars habitable and when was that in relationship to the Earth? When was that in relationship to uh, materials being uh, shifted between reservoirs, meteorites being delivered, organic material moving around the solar system? So those are the three science objectives that we chose to focus on for these studies. Next slide, please. In order to accomplish these, we want to use this radiometric dating that NASA has invested in. This is the process of determining the age of the rocks using the decay of radioactive elements. This is something that's been in widespread use in terrestrial labs. How we do this is by measuring the parent and the daughter isotopes in a pair to determine when a rock close to addition or loss of its radioactive elements. Here we're considering two pairs, rubidium strontium and potassium argon. That means the rubidium and the potassium are radioactive, over time, they decay to their daughters, strontium and argon. So we have to measure both the parent and the daughter. We have to measure their isotopes, and we have to measure their ratios. So it's a very challenging measurement that hasn't been yet done in situ. But it's done all the time in terrestrial labs, and a wide variety of rocks are really amenable to these uh, radioactive systems, including igneous rocks, phyllosilicates, sulfates, things that are widespread on the terrestrial planet. We know how to interpret those when we measure them. However, just measuring the isotope ratio is not an age. Measuring the isotope ratio is a number. An age is an interpretation of that number. So it requires both the accurate and precise measurement of the isotopes themselves, but also it requires adequate knowledge to interpret that measurement, to understand what that measurement means, what that date is. When something closed to radioactive movement, tells you that a volcano erupted or tells you that water flowed on the surface, something like that. So we have to interpret what that means to get an age. So for these missions, we're requiring that we measure the age of whatever lithology is going to answer those science goals with a precision of plus or minus 200 million years. This comes from the NASA technology roadmap that NASA has published, which is its desired uh, precision for in situ um, dating instruments. As it turns out the instruments um, themselves probably beat this precision, but because this is the NASA set uh, precision, we only considered questions that we could make progress on using this precision. We want to contextualize that desired lithology using petrology, mineralogy, elemental chemistry. Any of these kinds of techniques really give us the knowledge to interpret the measurement that we make. And then, of course, we want to relate that measured age to what we landed on. Because of course, the reason for doing in situ geochronology is to be able to relate these numbers to crater counts so that we can take this calibration with us to other planets. So in order to do these things, um, the mission has to help us. Um, it has to collect, characterize, and date 10 samples of half a centimeter to two centimeter size. We'll talk about these in a little more detail. And we built into our study a desirement to conduct this kind of analysis at two different states in one mission. So if you're going to go through all the trouble to put these instruments on, and I'll show you, they're pretty costly and heavy. If you're gonna go through the trouble to make this payload, we wanna get the most out of it. So we asked our engineering team to assess mobility options to take the same payload to two different places on a single body. Next slide, please. We have to show our science traceability matrix. You don't have to read this. There are a couple things that I want to talk you through, though. Science objectives, I just talked through measurement goals and measurement requirements. Um, let's talk about the things that the mission needs to do. Next slide, please. One of the things the mission needs to do is um, to collect, triage, and analyze these samples. 
So next slide, let's talk about the sampling statistics. Where do these numbers come from that set these requirements? When we date rocks in the laboratory, typically we would do them in duplicate or triplicate. So we would want three samples of the same thing to agree um, in their measurements so that we could confidently interpret that age. We understand that in the lab very well that you can take three pieces of the same thing and you may not come up with three of the same age. Um, that's because rocks are not naturally cooperative all the time just due to the vagaries of the way isotopes distribute themselves, the way minerals distribute themselves, the way weathering and alteration may happen in uh, a not homogeneous way across the rock. So we're allowing some samples for lithology to really um, uh, get to an age that we agree on that is defensible to the community um, and that has good statistics on it. So that's what we're requiring is for any lithology that you're interested in, if you're interested in the age of a basalt or the age of an impact melt, um, then we want to analyze 10 samples of that lithology. Now, wherever you go on a planet, there's regolith. It's true for the moon, it's true for Vesta, it's true for Mars. And in that regolith, there's stuff that's tossed around. You can pick the best sites. We've tried to pick the best sites we could where it's the most uniform lithology where the regolith is largely developed from the substrate that it's sitting on. But you can see in this Apollo 11 sample that it's mostly the basalt that Apollo 11 landed on, but there's a couple little bits in there that are not that basalt. So we have to increase that number that we want to collect and look at, even if we don't analyze that, so we can toss out the rocks that aren't the ones we want. So we will put a factor of three on that. Um, in the report, you can see sort of why we picked that in any specific mission that wants to fly is really going to have to defend that in more detail. Um, but for this study, we put a factor of three on and so we asked for 30 samples to be acquired and triaged. And that's our sample uh, term for looking at the samples um, and deciding um, what its mineralogy is, what its geochemistry is, so that we can decide whether to analyze it or not. So each of our instruments, as you'll see, um, the Institute Geochronology instruments, all of them, in fact, None of them are standoff or remote techniques. They're not something like ChemCam where you can shoot out at the rock and get the age back. These are techniques where we have to physically pick up a rock and ingest it in some way um, and really get to the interior of the rock. So that requires some sample handling and it requires a, a size um, bin that we stick to. This isn't something that we can do on soil. It's not something that we can do on ground up rock. We need a pebble to be able to do this on. So we constrained our size to a half a centimeter to two centimeters. That gives you a nice cross-section area that we can do multiple analyses on the same rock by two different techniques that gives us enough area to do that. So how many rocks of that size are in the regolith of any given body? Um, we looked at this in excruciating detail, which will come out in the report and hopefully in a paper. Um, but the bottom line is that uh, we have to sort through maybe one to three liters of material on each of these bodies to collect 30 of the right size samples. And then of those 30, hopefully 10 will be of the same lithology, and of those 10, hopefully three will agree in age. Um, and that's how we work the requirements for the sampling. Um, this kind of one to three liters is easily accommodated by current sampling technology. You could use an arm with a scoop and sieve. Um, we chose to use Planet Back. Um, this is sort of your choice when you want to propose this mission. Um, however, this works out for you. These are not big numbers um, and they're totally doable. Next slide, please. Okay, the other thing we want to highlight is, as I said, we asked our mission support team to uh, see if they could give us mobility to two different sites on each body. So next slide. Let's talk about these sites. The sites are important because uh, like I said, we want to get to um, locations where they're as homogeneous in geology as we can. They're as interpretable from orbit as we can. We have the highest probability of picking up rocks of the lithology that we want to date um, and that we have good crater counts that we can tie our radiometric ages to. So for the moon, um, we have two big questions on the moon. One is the chronology of basin forming impacts. And one is this middle ages uh, geochronology and also getting at these very young basalts to tell how long the lunar heat engine was active. So the sites that we chose for these two objectives 
Um, so the first one for basin forming impacts, there are small craters in the Christian and Nectar's basin that people have recently found and published on that seem to have poked through the basaltic cover and excavated the impact melt sheet directly of those basins. That's really important. The, uh, a lot of our debate about this topic has come because we have never sampled the melt sheet of a basin in situ on the moon before. All of our uh, debate about these samples comes because they were tossed out as objective. So really getting to an impact melt sheet of a basin would be an enormous accomplishment and being able to in situ date it would be really terrific to help resolve uh, the basin chronology. Now we understand that the closure minus 200 million years is a really um, tricky kind of thing to answer this. It doesn't, it's not gonna tell you whether a basin was 3.85 or 3.9 billion years old, but it would be able to tell you if either the Christian or Nectaris or anywhere you, you find this kind of geologic setting, whether it's closer to 3.9, that is Imbrian age, or closer or older than 4.1, which would make that cataclysm like spike become a weaker interpretation. So really we're here, we're just trying to tell the difference between a younger and an older basin. In the case of the young, young lunar basalts, this is something that a lot of people have looked at um, for a couple different missions. Um, so these are very well characterized young lunar basalts um, and they, um, because they're young, they don't have significant mature regoliths overlying them. So you're virtually guaranteed that if you can land on these, that you'll pick up pieces of that underlying basalt. And on the right-hand side, you can just see um, our safe landing sites that we um, chose for this. They're about one kilometer by a half a kilometer um, with uh, landing sites with constraints on um, slope, um, boulders, ruggedness, um, and these come from LRO images. Next slide, please. For Mars, we are interested in a good date on Mars that would tie Martian crater chronology to a radiometric age. This is something that we do not currently have, and it really hinders our ability to understand the entire Martian history. We know the order things happened in, but we don't know how to slide that up and down relative to Earth history, relative to solar system dynamic history. It's something that's crucial for Mars. So getting a date on Mars really requires that we have a good crater count. These are Hesperian lava flows are a really good place to do this. But something that we also wanna understand is the habitability of Mars. And when was Mars warm and wet? When was it habitable? So we asked our engineering team to look at uh, two locations on Mars that would um, address um, both of these questions. Um, there's a couple places on Mars um, that have both of these uh, materials accessible within the range of um, a rover, like a MER class rover or a Curiosity class rover. So those are the areas we really focused on here. Um, Nilifasi, Mars, and Northeast Sirtis. Um, these have been looked at for um, previous um, missions like MSL and Mars 2020. So there's a whole lot of engineering data um, landing site safety data out there that we did not have to repeat by picking these sites. Um, and there's lots of other sites that would be super interesting on Mars to do this on. Um, all of these either have um, bedrock exposed or they have a very thin regolith um, that would be very easily accessible. Next site, please, or next slide, which is also the next site when talking about Vesta here. Um, so for Vesta, we want to understand when the big basins formed. Again, this goes back to big basin chronology, although we do think that these basins might be much younger um, than the canonical uh, heavy bombardment or lyric cataclysm. We don't know that for sure, and there are competing models out there. Some of them make them very old and some of them make them very young. Um, there's also these uh, very enigmatic terrains on Vesta that we saw that may be related to uh, some kind of fluid dynamic flow. And I want to say fluid very loosely here, I'm using air quotes. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean water, um, but there are some kind of flow features um, that would be really great to look at and to understand uh, when those things form. So the two sites that we picked um, for Vesta, uh, Marcia Crater and Maria Silvia, um, we don't have uh, the high resolution images for Vesta that we do for um, the moon and Mars, but our landing sites are not um, constrained 
um, to be any specific place. Um, so this would take a little bit more work to find areas that um, you could go to, um, and then you may have to put on some onboard hazard avoidance or something. That's something that a, an individual can have a carter at. Next slide, please. Okay, all of our science goals at all of these sites are addressable by using a single payload. So this is the heart of all of our architecture options is our payload concept. So we developed a single payload um, in pretty great detail. Um, and then we investigated how to take this single payload to all of those destinations to accomplish those goals. I wanna just note that uh, this, these are the ones that we know about, and these are the people on our team, but this is generalizable to any suite of instruments that can accomplish the measurement requirement. So you can take our work as sort of a mass and power and operations envelope, and whatever you can fit in there with your creativity, you can do on these kinds of missions. And in the last column here, I just want to draw your attention quickly to the TRL. Our TRL assessment um, is by the time of the next Kalo survey, which is in 2023, these are the TRL of these particular instruments. Um, as I said, production has spent a significant amount of money and time and effort um, through the McTeeth and Belly programs. Um, a couple of these instruments are flying on clips. They've flown to Mars. Um, Tenetbach is flying on NMX. Um, the uh, trace element geochemistry is just getting started. Um, so it's going to come up to TRL4 under the Picasso program and we need an extra boost um, to get it up to TRL6 by the time of 2023 um, through a Dali or a Matisse. So fingers crossed for that, um, but that is our TRL assessment. So this is the, the payload that we're choosing to do. We chose to use two different geochronology techniques, radiometric geochronology techniques. That's not strictly necessary. Um, but it does give you two things. It gives you some extra confidence when the ages agree, which is great. It also can tell you about the history of the rock if the ages disagree. It's not a bad thing for having two different techniques disagree with each other. What that means is that two different uh, events happened where the rubidium behaved differently from potassium, which we know um, can be true in some cases. So either having them agree or disagree gives you extra science. Um, it gives you some extra confidence in your interpretation. And um, so we really wanted to explore using these both together. Both these measurements, the, both CDEX and CARLY, these particular implementations, both of them get elemental chemistry as a byproduct or as a, an addition to what they're doing for geochronology. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but they get major and minor elements. And so to give us more confidence in the interpretation, um, we added this ICPMS instrument to do trace element geochemistry. And that's really going to be important in distinguishing between basalt flows. Say you go to a basalt flow, but there's more than one in the area. Maybe you can distinguish between them. Um, maybe you can figure out whether something came from Imbrium or not. That would be really helpful on the moon. So an ICPMS will give us extra information in order to distinguish and interpret the rocks that we're looking at. We have mineralogy and uh, color imaging um, as pretty uh, standard but exciting components of our payload. They give us the extra uh, um, interpretability for those samples. They, bo they both look at the samples as well before we ingest them into in situ dating. So we get their mineralogy and their petrology. They also do double duty as looking at our site. So one of the things I said in the beginning was that we want to relate these rocks to the age of their site. And so this is what helps us do that. And then we do need sample handling. As I said, these are not CMF instruments. We do have to ingest samples from the regolith inside. So there are a variety of mechanisms, um, including planet back, um, that will come along to help us do that. Next slide, please. So the way these instruments work together, this is a very schematic layout. This is not necessarily the layout we choose for each one, but it's just to show you sort of how things happen. Planet back will dislodge the samples. Um, it does that by putting proofs of gas into the regolith and pushing up samples um, on that air proof. Um, they go through a sieve or a screen, they drop out the regolith, they bring the particles um, all the way up to the lander deck. They get deposited there just by gravity into a little um, tray, basically, where we can look at them with all of our instruments. So we can look at them with the imager um, and the spectrometer. 
There's a little arm that comes out and grabs the one we want, brings it to all these stations. Um, the stations are there to assist the instruments, the internal instruments, the geochronology instruments in making their measurements. So CDEX you see there, that's the rubidium strontium instrument. It requires that a sample have a ground flat base. So the first thing that happens is the sample gets picked up, it brings it to a grinding station that's like the Murat. Uh, it brings it to a microimager to look at that ground flat face. And then it brings it to the CDEX inlet that you can see there is like the little crown sticking out and holds it there for CDEX to do its measurements. Then the last thing it'll do is bring it over to the button on the top right, uh, sorry, on the top side there of Carly, there's a little button. Um, it brings it to that button that's an inlet for the Carly and ICPMS would share an internal sample carousel. So it'll just drop that rock off there and then an internal carousel will take it over for the Carly and ICPMS instruments. Outside of the lander on a map is where um, the imaging spectrometer, UCIS is, our stereo imagers, and our micro imager. And next slide, please. I'll show you a little more about where those are. Um, this is not any particular lander architecture. This is just to show you sort of the functional functionality of the instruments. You can see the instruments inside there in that layout I just showed you where the rock comes out and, and brings it inside. Outside on a map, you've got an agile mechanism there to give you full 360 viewing capability with panoramic cameras up to your imaging spectrometer. Both of them can turn and look at the footpath where the planet back is. Um, so we can see the actual soil that we landed on. Um, and they can also turn and look at that triage station so we can see the rocks that we just picked up. Next slide, please. We did a fair bit of work trying to understand how these would operate on the surface. Um, in terms of mass and power and time, what the actual operations are. I'm not going to walk you through this. I just wanted to show this to you to show you that when you do walk all the way through this, what I just showed you, plan it back, take it up, move it around, grind it, put it into Carly, ICPMS, do those analyses. It takes about 12 hours of our current best estimate time. Not everything is going to cooperate automatically. And so we put 100% margin on this just to be sure. So it's about 24 terrestrial hours per sample that we estimated for our surface ops lifetime. Now something that is um, built into this, um, this operations concept is that anytime there is an arrow, you can break. Um, there is no, there's nothing that's um, gonna sublime away. There's nothing that's gonna melt. There's nothing that's gonna become contaminated. So anytime that you need a break to recharge or it becomes night or anything like that, you can just break this wherever in the cycle, pick it up um, later. And in fact, within Carly and ICPMS, you can also just break there um, and pick it up again. So there are a lot of places in this cycle that you can break and pick up. Um, but for a full sample, it's about 24 hours. And that is running in parallel with the top left box, which is remote sensing of the site. So as long as you've got power and data, you can be doing your remote sensing in parallel um, with your sample analysis. You could also parallelize this process. Um, if you chose to, you could be having Carly and ICPMS run at the same time as CDEX, for example, to get two different um, radiometric dating at the same time. We chose not to pursue this in this study, just because we have a, a driving uh, worst case, I don't want to say worst case, but a longest case to drive out our operations time. But that is something that one could consider. Next slide, please. Um, I considered making this <laughs> just the top line, but you know we did all the masses and towers, so here it is for you. Um, the bottom line is that the total mass for the payload is about 133 kilograms um, for um, the lunar investor cases. There are a couple extra things we need to add for the Mars case because Mars has a natural atmosphere and it's not just acting as our vacuum pump. Um, so with those things, it's about 138 kilograms. And our driving power is for the Carly and CDEX and ICPMS all use laser ablation. And those lasers take a fair bit of power instantaneously. So our peak power is up there at about 150 watts um, for all the instruments. So those are really the things that are going to end up driving um, the mission concepts and sizing. Next slide, please. As I said, these are just very um, short spikes when we turn on the lasers. And so our power profile ends up looking spiky like this. 
Um, this is an example um, how to a profile. You land, you check out your uh, instrument deployments, you make sure everything is safe. You look around you and do some remote sensing, and then you get into the sample analysis cycle where you have spikes where the lasers turn on and off. Um, and so the, the average power may be a little bit lower, but we do need to have sufficient battery to drive our lasers. Um, and there's our cumulative data down there too. Um, our data are really driven by our imagers and not by the spectrometers. Um, and this is a totally uh, reasonable amount of data we think for this mission, for these classes of missions. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about how to accommodate this payload to the science onto specific missions. The uh, engineering team, um, we sat with them and said, okay, if you think we want to do, then this is what the mission really has to do for us. Um, our assumptions are the mission lifetime has to be at least six months um, and that we're a category two class B mission. Um, we picked uh, this big launch vehicle, the Falcon 9 with a five meter fairing. And then we've got requirements like, yep, you have to land safely um, and you have to do the analyses. But then you've got a whole host of other things that, that drive the architecture as well. Um, the power, the data, um, things like that. So you can see them all here. Next slide, please. So started with a lunar hopper. This is something that both we and um, the other team that I mentioned in the beginning wanted to understand. Uh, lunar hoppers have been suggested as a way to look at multiple sites on the moon. Um, so we really wanted to understand the hopper architecture and what it could do for us. Um, so we focused on bringing this entire big payload and we wanted to go to two sites that were separated by about a thousand kilometers, something like hundreds of kilometers. So say you went to P60 and you went to Christium, they're hundreds of kilometers apart, thousand kilometers apart. So to land our giant payload, or not giant payload, to land our big payload, and then land enough fuel to hop again gives you a, a feedback cycle of propellant and structure. So even using this heavy, the Falcon 9 heavy, um, with 15,000 kilograms of wet mass, we have to uh, bring a thousand kilogram lander with a structure to bring the fuel to hop, and then 11,000 kilograms of, of propellant. That's the uh, this goes in a, in a feedback cycle. Like I said, the more propellant you bring, the more um, structure you need to bring it, and then you're heavier, and so you need more propellant, and so you get into this, this uh, kind of loop. Um, and then you also need thermal to keep that fuel warm while you're sitting there through multiple days and nights on the moon. We did try to spend a single day, a single lit day at each site that would require you to land at dawn, take off at dusk, land at dawn at your next site. That uh, Newton mixed <laughs> because if you need to land on the near side of the moon, you're not bringing your own comm orbiter, you want to have direct to Earth comm. There's no uh, way to have one lit site for the whole full moon and then land at another lit site on the moon. The whole near side of the moon is going to go dark. Um, so there's just no way to do that, which drives you to have to survive multiple lunar nights. Once you're surviving a lunar night and you have to hold on to that heat to keep your fuel warm, now you need a lot of power. And so we investigated an RTG, and then we couldn't cool it when it's sunlit at noon. So you can see how we sort of drove ourselves up into this um, big, big, big mission. So this cost just immediately got us out of the New Frontiers class of missions. Um, but the lesson that we learned is um, how to hop on the moon. Hopping may be something that is feasible on the moon for hundreds of meters. Um, that's not far enough for this mission to get at two distinct sites. Um, the hop distance could increase if you decreased your payload um, down to something like 20 kilograms is when that becomes a lot more feasible. Neither of our geochronology instruments, um, even on their own, could come in within that very, very small payload. And so we didn't pursue this option any further. Hopping is obviously not going to work on Mars for a very similar reason, but as we'll see later, hopping does work on Vesta, the lower gravity well, less fuel, less severe day, night, and cycling. And so um, we'll see this come up again. Next slide, please. So we investigated a single lunar lander um, instead of a hopper. This closes uh, relatively easily with a new frontiers um, cost, as one would expect. Um, within a class B mission, we get our full payload. We get about a year's worth of operations. This is a direct 
uh, direct insertion, direct landing on the moon with terrain relative navigation, um, and we get more than enough power um, and calm to do our full mission for a year. Um, this is something that we might want to consider finding a different landing site where you could maybe accomplish more than one objective or have some secondary objectives. If you can last for a year, you can look at a lot of samples. Next slide, please. As I said, the Vesta hopper did close. Um, it's got a much lower gravity well, um, so you can get to multiple sites. Um, you have to make sure there's sunlit when you get there. Rhea Sylvia at the South Pole is eclipsed for a year and sunlit for a year, so we have to make sure that we um, get there when it's sunlit. Um, and our solar, of course, is, uh, you know, goes down as we go out into the asteroid belt, and so we get less power. And so we are investigating ways to bring down our CONOP so that we can come down into the power profile that um, is allowed by the VESTA concept. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the series lander concept. I think these are uh, two of a kind. So next slide, please. For Mars, um, the first thing we did was look at the host of things that are out there or have been proposed and just assess them relative to our desires. Um, so MER class rovers, small landers are too small. Um, they're not going to accommodate even our reduced payload. Um, and things that we might want to do, like put our whole payload onto a Curiosity or a Perseverance chassis, you can't even get the chassis <laughs> for a new frontier cost. So it doesn't matter what your payload is there. It's going to be out of our cost cap. So um, we didn't think that mobility was going to be a, something that was reasonable for this study. Um, so we chose to focus, next slide, we chose to focus on um, small landers of the Phoenix and, and InSight class to see whether we could bring our full payload to Mars on a lander. So next slide, please. Um, for this, Goddard is working with an industry partner um, with Heritage and these kinds of Mars landers um, to try to bring our full payload. Um, we're gonna split up our operations to fit within the power profiles we want to make sure that we um, do this with solar, so we're going to try to land um, in time to get the maximum time between best seasons that we can. Um, this isn't done yet. This is very much a work in progress. Um, and so we still need to assess whether we can fit into um, a Phoenix or InSight um, size. If we have to size it up, that's going to drive some cost. Um, and we may need to trim payload either for math or cost reasons. Um, but I want everyone to keep in mind that InSight and Phoenix were discovery class missions. If we were to cost these using the study methodology, they come in into a new frontiers class um, for this margin. And I'm not saying we shouldn't use this margin. We absolutely should because these are just very much concept studies. Um, but I just want people to be aware that um, these, these, uh, con this class of landers, I think, would be very feasible within the frontiers. Given the insight. Sorry, sorry, Barb, to interrupt, but two minute warning. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, now next slide, please. Um, we're doing cost and scheduling. I don't think you need to know the details of those. Um, so let's get to the next slide. So to summarize our architecture options, um, BESA has an architecture option that meets our full sample science at multiple sites and a new frontier's cost. Thumbs up. We're very happy with that result. For the Moon and Mars, um, both the cost and the payload mass took a significant mobility, um, whether by hopper or by rover. And this was true even if we tried to reduce our payloads. We did try to say, well, what if we had only one geochronology instrument? Could we make the mobility work? And the answer was no. So it's both the cost and the payload mass um, preclude that mobility option. Um, but our science team, uh, next slide, our science team has evaluated these and we believe that a single site lander on the moon or Mars is still a very valuable contribution, answering really significant community identified science goals. Um, these kinds of missions, they don't just do in situ geochronology. As I mentioned at the beginning, all of these instruments take multiple other measurements that you really want, no matter where you go and no matter what you're interested in in the geology. So, all these kinds of major minor trace element analysis, we also get volatile analysis organic molecule analysis, geotechnical properties, long-lived monitoring, all of these things come with any lander that you can put down with this kind of very capable payload. And just as a note, smaller missions like Discovery class or Clips class 
wouldn't be capable of making the full suite of desired measurements as we've defined them. However, I think that it's definitely possible that you can pose a very well-bounded question with maybe a reduced payload, like a single method of radiometric dating or a downsized characterization suite that you could fit into a discovery or, or possibly even at a stretch of clips mission. So I'm not saying that you can't do these. It's just for the boundaries that we've defined, these are new frontiers class missions. So last slide, please. To sum up, um, the recommendation that we would make to the decadal survey is that they should specify science goals for new frontiers missions, including these really important science goals that are geochronology. But be a little bit flexible. You could do these by sample return. I am never going to say that institute geochronology is better than sample return. It absolutely is not. Sample return would be great, but sample return also tends to be very expensive. And this could be a really good alternative for going to a lot of different places um, and answering some of these really high priority science questions if you pose the question correctly. So we advocate to the decadal survey panel that they include these missions in the new frontiers list to answer these compelling science questions with the flexibility to implement them with the creativity of the science community, which could be either by sample return or by in-situ dating. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Barb. That was great. Uh, we do have a handful of questions for you on the uh, Google Doc. Uh, I think we're only going to have time for one. Uh, Kim Ray from JPL asks, if in situ measurements are used to recalibrate the crater count versus age curve for the moon, what is the rationale for using that at other bodies? Would similar measurements have to be made elsewhere? Well, right now we use the lunar crater curve and we extend it to other bodies by using modeling factors. Um, that is as good as our models. Um, so we can continue to refine our models, um, but if we refine our lunar crater curve, um, we also want to do this on other bodies so that we can really understand what those factors are that make different bodies uh, have their own crater chronology. They're not all identical to the moon. So there is absolutely a case to be made for making these measurements on multiple bodies. 